Broken the Game Theorem, where we have serious discussions about absurd entertainment. It's Junko Inoshima, because it's always been her. Even if it's boring or repetitive, she's always the mastermind, isn't she? Sumugi Shirogane, the ultimate cosplayer. All right, we're finishing up Danganronpa. This is our last episode of our Danganronpa series, the finale to the chronological storyline that is Danganronpa. Mm-hmm. I think it'll be part eight. Yeah. Yeah. So this has been fun. And, you know, if this is your first time listening to it, go back and listen to all the other ones, unless you want to just spoil the end for yourself, because it's going to be something. And... I guess we might as well get into it. We're going to basically finish the story, and then we'll have some afterthoughts about what we think about Danganronpa as a whole. Mm -hmm. So let's go where we left off. We left off with the reveal that Kaito is sick. All right. There are very few characters left, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, by this point, yeah. Oh, and as a reminder of trigger warnings for everything, also we'll be using meta and fiction to talk about which level of reality we are discussing. Mm -hmm. For starting, of course, where we left off with fiction. As a reward for completing the trial, Monokuma provided the students with keys to unlock new areas of the academy. However, Kokichi went into hiding somewhere in the facility, scheming a plan to end the killing game. He figured that if he could make Monokuma break one of his own rules for governing the game, the game would be defunct, and the mastermind would possibly feel obligated to execute themselves in response. That's kind of reminiscent of the first game. Yeah, because that's what happened with Junko. Meta. Kokichi suspected that, despite the lore they all suspected to be true, this killing game must have an audience of some kind that required the mastermind to follow the rules. Fiction Kokichi used the remote control that Mio had devised to hack into the Exosols so that he could control them. With them under his control, he was able to defang and detain Monokuma at his hidden location. Kokichi devised a murder plan that would require an accomplice to make an unknowable culprit for Monokuma. He took extensive notes and drew diagrams about the plan. Knowing he would have to sacrifice himself for the plan to work, he wrote a loose script of how the trial would go down, detailing things he would say in every hypothetical scenario he could imagine for his trial. After working out most of the details, Kokichi decided not to use the plan unless another killing happened, and he aimed to dissuade that from happening. He also made a will that he left in his room alongside a bunch of other equipment he used in his schemes in the event that he died. His will revealed an unsolved puzzle that the other students have failed to notice. With Monokuma absent and Kaito gravely ill, Kaito began scheming to do an assault upon Monokuma, thinking the Exosols were useless now that the Monocubs were dead. He began gathering weapons he could find, even asking Maki to show him how to construct a crossbow from her ultimate lab. So things are getting really intense. Kaido and Kokichi are both kind of going like suicidal in the hopes of ending the game. Mm -hmm. They're they're thinking of more than just themselves, but in very different ways. Yep. Kaido's like, well, I'm going to die anyway. Might as well end this game. Kokichi's just like, this game isn't fun anymore. (laughs) (laughs) When Kaido invited the other students to the gym where he stowed the weapons to convince them to join him in an assault... Kokichi arrived as well, bringing the electro bombs and electro hammers with him. Kokichi lied to them as he usually did about his true motives, but they had tired of him. They refused to cooperate with him, and he left Miu's weaponry to them. And I know we went on a whole bunch about uh, the tragedy of the character of Miu in the last episode, but here is literally proof that her inventions are invaluable. The plot could not have happened without her. And literally, even after death, she is saving all of them. She truly is, I think, the best character of this game. Mm-hmm. And Kokichi just kind of ganks her stuff and takes credit. Kokichi's such a jerk. Ugh, yeah. 
The other students use the electro hammers to finally cross the death road of despair, only to find out that the world was uninhabitable. Kokichi, who had followed them, surprised them by lying to them that he was the leader of the ultimate hunt and the mastermind. To prove it, he displayed his command of the Exosols, and they all were compelled to believe him. Kaito attempted to fight him, and Kokichi used an Exosol to take him hostage. You have to admit, that's a lot of convincing evidence that he's trumped up, you know? Yep. And this scene is so dark when you find out that literally these are the only human beings left in existence. Mm-hmm. At least in the fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kokichi left with Kaido and the Exosols to the Exosol hangar, locking it behind him. He thought that perhaps he could convince Kaido to be his accomplice in his plan to end the killing game if one ever started. He also thought that pretending to reveal himself as the mastermind and filling the students with despair would dissuade them from continuing the killing game ever again. He had most of the Exosols patrolling outside the hangar watching Monokuma. Monokuma, unable to fight the Exosols, simply waited. So Monokuma's effectively been taken out of the equation right now because uh, Kokichi really just didn't want Monokuma involved, right? Mm -hmm. And the actual mastermind is unable to do anything about this right now. Yep. And Kokichi's whole motive is like, He's kind of an ally. He wants the killing game to end. He's taking on the blame for our suffering or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. But he's being a total jerk about it. Yeah. <laughs> he's making himself like this like martyr or something, and it's just like, okay, Kokichi, whatever. Mm-hmm. I had to make this extremely elaborate, convoluted plan that would make me the martyr that you'd have to thank for all eternity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The other students were completely dejected with despair upon learning that they had been killing the few surviving members of humanity. Samugi, however, used their morose behavior as an opportunity to surreptitiously provide the next flashback light, simply leaving it in the kitchen for them to find. With nothing to lose, they used it, and it gave them all of their memories back, including the tragedy, Junko and Oshima, Hope's Peak Academy, Future Foundation. And hope. Meta. Sumugi had made that flashback light hastily to not be discovered, and so there were some inconsistencies when comparing the memories she programmed to the lore of the Hope's Peak Academy arc. Lore inconsistencies, no! (laughs) I mean, I admit I am frustrated by lore inconsistencies in fictional media. Mm -hmm. But she was in a rush because the one writing the lore is also a character. (laughs) fiction they put all of their memories together to form a cohesive narrative of their lives in their minds and they brightened with a sense of hope they rationalized that the remnants of despair must never have been vanquished that they just rebranded as the ultimate hunt and they theorized that kokichi must have been one of them they decided to prepare an assault to capture kokichi and rescue kaito Himiko scouted the Exosol hangar and discovered that Kokichi had locked Kaido in the bathroom, which had a small window to the outside of the hangar. Through the window, Kaido asked Himiko to smuggle one of Maki's crossbows to him so that he could wound Kokichi and escape. Himiko agreed and smuggled through the window the pieces of the crossbow, which he reassembled. Later that night, Maki decided to do the assault early by herself because she wanted to kill Kokichi in revenge for making them play this game. After all, Kokichi's like, I'm the bad guy, haha, just just live in fear. And Maki's like, no, I'm gonna kill you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She went to the hangar with another crossbow and an electro hammer, but she had laced the arrows with Strike 9 poison from Shuichi's lab. The hangar was protected with an electrified shield, but she used her electro hammer to take out one of the exosols. She then got inside it and used it to bypass the barrier. Meanwhile, Kaido ambushed Kokichi and fired an arrow, non-lethally, into his arm in an effort to overpower him. The two of them then started brawling, but that was when Maki entered the hangar in her exosol. When Kokichi attempted to use his remote to control the exosol, Maki shot Kokichi with a poisoned arrow. Maki interrogated Kokichi as the poison slowly killed him, demanding to know why he had started the killing game for the remnants of despair. 
but Kokichi hadn't seen the flashback light and didn't know about them. He lied to give her the answer she wanted, but when that failed, she shot another poisoned arrow to his head to kill him. So this is interesting because the whole like meta and fiction we've been talking about, it's now inconsistent. Everyone else has the memory that Kokichi was definitely a remnant of despair, but not Kokichi. He wasn't there for that flashback light. Mm-hmm. So even though according to the fiction, that's who he was, he doesn't remember doing this thing that kind of never happened. Mm-hmm. He's, he's reading from a different book in sort of a way as to what his character is. Yeah. He, he knows that he's just a troublemaker, that he's not literally the architect of despair, right? Mm-hmm. But everyone else knows that he is. We have a lore inconsistency. Yep. And Maki kills him for it. Mm-hmm. He, he may not be dead yet. He's just poisoned, but that means she's going to be the one marked to kill him. Have to, and they'll have to go through a trial because of it. Yep. However, Kaido didn't want Maki to be executed for murder, and so he jumped in front of the Kokichi, taking the arrow for him and momentarily saving his life. Maki panicked and ran out of the hangar to retrieve the antidote from Suichi's lab so that Kaido wouldn't die. So now they're both poisoned. Maki's going to get a double murder. Mm-hmm. After Maki left, Kokichi realized he needed to pitch his plan to Kaito before it was too late. He locked the hangar, and Maki had to give the antidote to Kaido through the bathroom window. But Kokichi snatched it from Kaito and pretended to drink it, making Maki think Kaito would die. Maki, having drained the battery of her electro hammer and not able to get back into the hangar, then did everything she could to tear the console door apart to save Kaito. But she failed, and eventually had to give up. Oh, that, that part was really sad. Mm-hmm. You see the, the, the console, like, she's just, like, completely jammed at it with a knife, and she just can't get in. Mm-hmm. After Maki left, Kokichi used his electro bomb to disable the nanokumas from surveilling them for monokuma. He then fed Kaido the one dose of antidote in a gesture of good faith. Kokichi showed Kaido his diagram, scripts, and plans, and explained his plan to him. Kaido didn't trust him and wasn't sure whether to do it. Kaido wanted to end the killing game, but only agreed when Kokichi pointed out that helping him with his plan would prevent Maki from being a murderer of either of them. Sparing Maki from execution was enough for him. So this is really interesting. I think this is the most human we ever see Kokichi. Because now Kokichi is in a situation where, well, I'm going to die from this poison anyway. There's only one antidote, and there's two of us poisoned, right? Mm -hmm. So Kokichi's like, So we might as well do the plan I had come up to make me a martyr since I'm going to die anyway. And if we don't, then your girlfriend's going to get executed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, did he come up with this? Like, I feel like he must have been kind of just winging and adapting the plan on the fly. I think so. Yeah. Because he only got Kaido to go along with it because otherwise Maki would be the murderer. He really underestimated Maki. Yep. Kokichi and Kaido worked together to set up the crime scene to make it look like Kokichi had killed Kaido, which included dragging Kokichi across the ground to leave a blood trail, as Kokichi still bled from his wounds. Kokichi set up a video camera to record footage of Kaido being crushed by the hydraulic press, whose safety function had also been disabled by the electrobomb. Right before Kaido was crushed, Kokichi stopped the video and the press. The two swapped places and clothes, and Kaido resumed both the video and the press. The angle of the video showed the grisly gore as Kokichi was crushed, without revealing that the victim in the video had been swapped at the last moment. Say what you will about Kokichi, he was dedicated to his plan of being the martyr. With Kokichi dead, Kaido stuck to his promise and continued the rest of the plan. He sabotaged the press so that it would never lift again, and he then jumped into the unattended exosol that had already been made available. Remember what Maki did? Mm -hmm. The remote control was crushed when Kokichi was, releasing the exosols from his control, except for the one that Kaito controlled. Kokichi had left Kaito instructions on how to modulate his voice while within the exosol. So basically, the two people go in, one person comes out. That person that comes out is in an exosol. We don't know which person it was, and we don't know which person died. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're telling you now, because 
we're telling you exactly what happened, but none of the other characters know. Mm -hmm. When Monokuma was freed from the threat of the exosols and discovered that a murder had occurred, he didn't want to admit that he was ignorant of the murder, and so he played along with the occupied exosol to keep the game going as per the rules. He took the exosol to the trial chamber to await the class trial. Yeah, so Monokuma's quietly furious about this. Monokuma's supposed to know the correct answer before going into the trial, and even Monokuma doesn't know. Mm-hmm. But Monokuma has to play by the rules. Yep. Mastermind always has to play by the rules. Mm -hmm. The next day, the other students began their assault. Maki only brought her knife, having already drained her electro hammer. Their assault failed when they discovered that a murder had occurred and Monokuma appeared before them. While the students conducted their investigation, Samugi snuck out to birth the Monokub so that Monokuma could later regain control of the Exosols. After the investigation, the students had a class trial. The Exosol played the part of both Kaito and Kokichi. Using the script Kokichi had made, along with Kaito's improvisation, the Exosol tried to lead the trial to the conclusion that the culprit was unknowable. When Monokuma realized that the ruse was to get him to incorrectly declare the verdict of the trial, he joined in on the class trial at the Exosol's expense. So if, in case that's not clear, basically, Monokuma doesn't know the answer. So whatever the outcome of the trial is, if Monokuma's like, okay, yeah, your vote was right or wrong, whatever, and then the Exosol opens and proves Monokuma's verdict incorrect, it would reveal the trial was a sham mm -hmm. in the hopes that the game would be a sham, not worth continuing, and that Monokuma and the Mastermind would have to admit defeat and possibly even face punishment for breaking the rules. Mm-hmm. So now Monokuma is having to argue in the trial because even he doesn't know. Yep. <laughs> At first, they suspected Maki and then Kokichi, but Suichi eventually determined that the body switch had happened and that Kaido had been the murderer. At the last moment, Suichi realized what Kaido was trying to do, and he began lying to try to convict Kokichi for the sake of making Monokuma declare an incorrect verdict. However, it was too late. While Monokuma may have given an incorrect verdict and violated the rules previously, Suichi's logic was airtight. Monokuma was very likely to give the correct verdict. You, you did the detective work too good. You <laughs> gave Monokuma the correct answer. Mm -hmm. and, and, he's, and Shuichi's like, oh, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to just lie. Yeah, it's the other way. It's the other way. And Monokuma's like, no, no, I, 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 I heard, heard what you said, mm -hmm. dummy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of Kokichi and Kaido's work was for naught. I mean, at least Maki didn't get executed, but Kokichi's idea of being martyred just fell through. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe working alone wasn't the answer, that you have to actually team up with your compatriots. Mm -hmm. Just saying. <laughs> maybe know, being Kokichi. the martyr. <laughs> yeah, well, you know Kokichi wasn't going to work with everyone. He, yeah, he, but he wanted to be like the victim. He wanted to be, yeah, he wanted to put it all on himself. I know, I know. Kaito did not like those odds and did not want to risk Monokuma executing all of them. And so Kaito gave himself up, exiting the Exosol. They convicted Kaito correctly and Kaito explained the details of Kokichi's failed plan. Kaido's illness was also becoming incredibly severe, making him barely able to stand without the Exosol supporting him. Meanwhile, the Monokubs returned to Monokuma's side to bring the Exosols back under Monokuma's control. Blast off, second ignition, Kaito's execution. Monokuma pressed a button that activated an escape pod retrofitted into a rocket. The rocket encapsulated Kaito, turned around, and launched into the ground, drilling through the thin crust and plowing through the mantle, before going through an ocean on the opposite side of the planet and then into low Earth orbit. Meta. While the rocket was at its peak in the air when it was just about to begin falling, Kaido purposefully choked himself, coughing up enough blood to induce a heart attack and kill himself before the execution could complete. 
The rocket crashed back through the earth before landing in the academy where it started. Kiba tried to protect the other students from the crash, but in so doing, his antenna was knocked off his head. Monokuma was furious that the execution had not gone according to the script. He realized that and used an emergency flashback light on the students that would make them regain all of their fictional memories in the hopes of putting them back on script. So this execution is really interesting because they do the whole standard music and the Danganronpa execution theme. And this is literally an homage to the very first execution in the very first game. Mm -hmm. Jin's execution, remember? Mm -hmm. And But now with an actual astronaut. And Kaito's just like, no, you're not going to get your views and kills himself mid-execution before the finale. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of like, a, yeah, you get them, Kaido. You go out on your own terms kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was just really beautiful and sad. And Monokuma is not happy. And something's going on with Kibo? Yeah. <laughs> All right, fiction. The remaining students met up that night after the trial. Meta. We're getting really into the meta now, because now we're going off script. Mm -hmm. Kibo didn't show. He was dealing with the ramifications of losing his antenna. He was no longer receiving signals from it, and what he perceived to be his conscience was quiet. He felt peaceful, like he had been gifted free will for the first time. With his free will returned, he made the decision to end the killing game by destroying the entire academy. He got his equipment from his lab and upgraded himself with laser guns and a jetpack, and he got to work. And so this entire time, Kibo's been like, there's this little voice in my head. That's my free will. It's actually the other way around. That voice in his head is guiding him and controlling him. It's the audience. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the real world version of it. Mm -hmm. That's not what the fiction says, but that's the meta narrative. Mm -hmm. And now that that's gone because the antenna's gone, Kibo's like, I feel like myself for the first time. Previously, Kibo refused to use weapons. That was the voice in his head. Now he's like, oh no, I'm destroying everything. Yeah. I'm done playing by the rules of this game. Mm -hmm. Monokuma and the Monokubs were startled by the sudden destruction, and they chased Kibo down in the Exosols. They were furious that Kibo was going completely off script. He wasn't supposed to come to this revelation nor destroy the Academy. The other students, not wanting to die, asked Kibo what was going on. Shuichi said there may be a better way, and he asked Kibo to let them investigate the academy to discover a way to end the game without dying themselves. Kibo said he would hold the Exosols off until morning, when he would use the last of his energy to destroy the academy. Remember, the academy is like an air bubble on a hostile earth, supposedly. Mm -hmm. So destroying the academy means supposedly they would all die. Mm -hmm. At least according to the fiction. Yep. Suichi, Maki, Himiko, and Sumugi investigated various parts of the academy that they had previously been unable to access, thanks largely due to Kibo blasting holes in various doors and walls. They learned a lot about the backstory of the Ark, and they met Mother Kuma, mother of the Monokumas. During their investigation, the students periodically received memories from their fabricated past, though they seemed real. In addition, the audience flooded Team Danganronpa with complaints about Kibo not responding to their commands. Oh yeah, they were mad. After the investigation, Shuichi pitched a final trial to Monokuma, one where Monokuma and the Mastermind would be exposed for breaking the rules of their own killing game. Monokuma accepted only if Kibo stood down. Shuichi convinced Kibo that this was better than destroying the academy, and Kibo handed himself over to the Monokubs in their exosols. They repaired his antenna and removed his weaponry. Monokuma snickered. Though Kibo had significantly accelerated the plot to the endgame, they were back on script. So this is what actually Monokuma wanted. I mean, he wasn't planning on going this way, mm -hmm. but... Now they're back within the rules. Now they're back in his domain. Yeah. And Shuichi's kind of a fool for doing that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, get, I get the reason they did it. They're like, no, please don't kill our only home on the planet. Yeah. But remember, that's only in the fiction. That's not reality. Yeah. If Kibo had destroyed it, they could have just left. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know that, though. Yeah. Fiction. After the investigation, the students had a class trial, starting by having a retrial of the first case. 
Suichi suspected that Kaede had not truly been Rintaro's murderer. At first, they suspected Rintaro or a remnant of despair might be the mastermind. However, they pieced together the evidence regarding the secret rooms and realized that Rintaro's real killer must have been the mastermind themselves. They narrowed down their suspects until the only one it could be was Sumuki. Now, we talked about this, but um, yeah, Kaede's murder was a complete sham. Worst mm-hmm. case in the entire series. Yep. And we talked about the real way it went down instead of the lie they tried to tell you at the beginning of the game. Mm-hmm. That she was super guilty and stuff. She wasn't even responsible. Yeah. But the script said that she was supposed to be the murderer, so they acted like she was. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so now they've pinned it down on Samugi. And also at this point, like they don't even like hate Samugi. They don't, they're just like, well, it has to be one of us. And Samugi, your alibi just doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. And Samugi's like, oh, please trust me. Monokuma forced the Monocubs to play devil's advocates against the students, arguing against their points. But the students' logic was thorough. Each time they failed him, Monokuma pressed a detonator that killed a Monocub until he eventually killed them all over again. (sighs) That was so sad. It's just torture. The Monocubs... They're not great, but they're not evil. It's, they, they didn't ask to be made. Yeah. Unable to argue her way out of conviction, Sumugi relented and revealed herself as the mastermind, Junko and Ishima the 53rd. She told them of her plan to infiltrate the Gopher Project and play one last big killing game for humanity. Meta. However, the students had seen much more than just that in their investigation. Shuichi in particular noticed several inconsistencies in the Danganronpa lore, particularly with the consistency between their memories and other sources, like a book called The History of Hope's Peak Academy. The students called the mastermind out on this upon realizing that their memories were fabricated and demanded to have the real answers behind the killing game. So... If you uh, remember way back when we were doing the backstory, I think this was probably a few episodes ago, Mm -hmm. uh, after the rebuilding of civilization, we talked about how Hope's Peak either accepted applications or did scouting, and it wasn't clear which. Mm -hmm. It's a lore inconsistency. Yep. Because the book says one thing and their memories say another. Exactly. As the students deconstructed what they believed to be true... Danganronpa V3 was charging forward to the big reveal and finale, where the meta-narrative would be revealed. By this point, the identities of Sumugi, the staff writer of Team Danganronpa, Sumugi, the ultimate cosplayer, and Junko and Ishima, the 53rd, began to bleed together. So many identities jumbled around in her head on various levels of reality, in part helped by the fact that she was not only the mastermind in the fiction, but also a developer of that fiction, that the identities overlapped with compatible goals between the three. All three of them were effectively game masters of fiction. Yeah, so this Samugi character is a combination of three different people. Mm -hmm. She is Samugi, she is Junko, she is Kodaka. (laughs) (laughs) Sumugi revealed her talent as the ultimate cosplayer, where she tapped into the augmented reality of the set to alter her appearance to any fictional character she wanted. She was limited to depicting fictional characters by her fictional counterpart's cospox condition. That wasn't an issue so long as she only portrayed fully fictional characters that never had real-world counterparts, and so she began rotating her appearance between the cast of the first two Danganronpa games. They try to make it out out like it's something more complex than that. I'm in Cospox, which means I must be fictional, but like we we already talked about the first time the Cospox thing happened, how ridiculous it was. Mm -hmm. Because there's a bit of a logical fail there if you just don't accept the fact that the reason it's okay for her to portray the first two games cast is because they didn't have this like meta narrative element to them. They were purely fictional and they didn't have a real world component to them. Samugi, the fictional character, rationalized her abilities as staff writer, allowed her to cosplay the whole world. However, Junko was Samugi's favorite character and one of her fictional identities. And so Junko's motivation ceased to be purely fiction when she bled into Samugi's identity. Junko wished to bring despair beyond the fictional dead world and into the living world through the audience. Junko's goals of keeping the killing games going forever and ever were well aligned with Samugi's, all in the hopes of weaponizing 
using Danganronpa itself to bring despair to the real world. To that end, Samugi kept going with the trial, with the assistance of her other self in the form of Monokuma, allowing the students to come to realize that their entire existence was fictional through the course of the trial. Do you have any questions about that, Kira? No. You get it? All of it? Yeah, yeah. Basically, all these three characters have the same goal, they're, and they're so merged that... They not only want to cause despair in the fiction as Junko, the character, but uh, it bleeds into Samugi, the staff writer, and she also wants to cause despair into the real world. Yeah, think of it this way. Um, the staff writer, Samugi, the, the self-insert for Kadaka, right? The, the author, right? Mm -hmm. She's like, she's just, I want more Danganronpa. Danganronpa has to keep going, right? Mm -hmm. And then Samugi as the character is just a fan of despair and Junko, right? Mm -hmm. As the mastermind, she wants to keep this going. She loves Danganronpa. She's Danganronpa's biggest fan. Mm -hmm. And then Junko, as the arch villain of the series, wanting to bring despair to the world, Junko's just like, okay, so we're all fictional, except for me. I kind of have a bit of realness to me by the fact that I'm also the staff writer, apparently. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Why don't we just bring despair to the real world? <laughs> By having Danganronpa just be a despair-inducing video game. <laughs> and it's a real acknowledgement of the uh, emotional appeal that video games and other art can have on the real world. Mm -hmm. despair can be brought about not just by straight up like killing people or having killing games. It can also just be brought about by having depressing art. Mm -hmm. uh, that it can emotionally affect you in that way. Mm -hmm. Particularly considering in this case, the real world, Danganronpa is the biggest video game series and real, wor real world people get sacrificed to play it. So I guess it's a bit more than that. Mm -hmm. I also like the idea that Monokuma is like her other self because Monokuma is a branch off from Junko. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's almost like there's a fourth person that's part of the, the, the triumvirate. <laughs> <laughs> the students came to realize the futility of their existence. They learned of the audience, that they were just characters in the 53rd game of Danganronpa, and that their old selves had been willing participants of the game. The students fell into despair, but the audience pushed Kibo to fight for hope. Remember, he has the voice in his head again. Mm -hmm. When Kibo thought he could bring his friends some hope, Sumugi revealed that he was just an avatar for the audience, and so she wanted to see Kibo's hope deliberately broken to thus also break the audience mm -hmm. if you have an avatar for the audience and in the fiction that means junko has someone that stands for all of the outside world people that she can break <laughs> yep Samugi so then got down to business by telling the students that the game was supposed to be played until only two participants remained, as dictated by the rules. Even if they had been fortunate to go off script and thus get to the finale with more participants than expected, only two could win the game, going with the tradition of the final choice of hope versus despair. Samugi so told them that two of them would have to sacrifice themselves to win, but Kibo... Uh, immediately volunteered. Maki followed soon after. Right. The rules say you can only have two survivors. So since they accelerated to the end and got to this point sooner, more of them are alive than we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So they need people to sacrifice themselves for the game to end properly, according to the rules. Mm -hmm. With the sacrifices chosen, Sumugi clarified the choice before them in the upcoming vote. The students could choose to vote for despair through Samugi to execute her. But the killing game would continue. The rest of them would probably never kill again, but instead live out the rest of their lives in the academy in the arc on the set. Alternatively, they could vote for hope through Kibo, which would result in Kibo and Maki being punished. But the rest of them would be able to return to the real world. Maki's punishment would be to become the next ultimate survivor, while Kibo would be executed. So Maki would be the next Rantaro. Yep. And Kibo would just be killed as a finale. Mm -hmm. And that would be exactly what Junko slash Samugi slash Samugi wants. Yep. Uh, because that would be executing the point of view character for the audience. Mm hmm. It would be as despair-inducing as Kaede's execution was for, for us. 
Yeah. Which, by the way, the whole idea of you playing as Kaede in the first chapter and then switching to Shuichi is completely against the meta narrative. It makes absolutely no sense. Kibo should be the main character. Why is Kibo not the main character? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I like the idea of playing as a woman, but they obviously didn't want you to do that because it killed her off in the first chapter anyway. Yep. So Kibo should have just been the main character all along. Shuichi, who gives a crap about Shuichi? <laughs> Shuichi is, a, is just a less likable version of Kyoko. <sighs> yeah, I agree with you. I really don't like Suichi much, and at least if it was Kibo, then the audience surrogate thing would... Uh, Make sense for the narrative. Yeah, it really would. All right. Suichi rejected the premise of the decision and the dichotomy. He explained to the others that this decision is for what the past students of the games always fell. He argued that hope wasn't defined by just a dream of a better future, but also contrasted with the despair it was not. Regardless of the decision they made, more Danganronpa games would be made, and more people would be killed, regardless of their own fates. He argued that neither ending mattered, because both hope and despair required the other to define themselves. He convinced Kibo, Maki, and Himiko to join him in refusing to cast a vote. So here we have some basic, like, the basic theme of this game is the rejection of bipartisanship? Mm hmm Because... We already saw this theme building up in Danganronpa 3, where Hope kind of became a bad guy right at the end. Mm -hmm. The idea of brainwashing for Hope's sake when, uh, with uh, the ultimate animator, mm -hmm. right? So what we have here is a continuation of that thesis to its logical conclusion. The idea that, yes, despair is bad, but hope isn't really much better. You hope for a better world. By definition, that means you're not in that better world. You are hoping for it. You have not achieved it. You have not reached it. Hope only exists to define itself against despair. So therefore, if you want a third option, it doesn't mean you're necessarily between hope and despair and just being apolitical or crap. You could potentially be going further, saying, I'm not going to hope for a better world. I want that better world. I'm going to get that better world. I, th this artificial choice you have given me is not good enough. And I think it kind of speaks to how like video games inherently have violence whenever they do do choices. You know, you might like a good RPG, and no matter how many choices they give you, you're limited by the fact that those are the only choices. There are always extra that they simply may not have thought to provide. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of the way I see this. I think it's the most charitable conclusion. The worst way you could take it is basically just like goodness and badness are both wrong. We should get absolute neutrality. Mm -hmm. But obviously that's a very childish take. Anyway, Monokuma panicked and antagonized the students in a desperate attempt to make them fight for hope. But the students refused to continue playing Danganronpa. Since not casting a vote was against the rules, everyone but Samugi would be executed. The audience, however, did not like that Kibo was ignoring their commands to side with Hope, and they voted to erase Kibo's personality. Kibo bowed farewell to his classmates as he was reset to his factory settings. Samugi made it clear that Kibo would vote for Hope as the audience wished, even if the others didn't vote. So they just, like, kill Kibo in the middle of a trial. Yep. Just straight up murder him. Yep. His body's it's still awful. there. Now he's literally just, like, an automaton acting out the audience desires. Yeah, it's it's awful. Because Kibo had his own personality. I know. Kibo and Mew forever. <laughs> <laughs> the students pleaded with the audience to look at the bigger picture about what they were doing. About how their lives mattered fictional or not, that real people died in these games, that despair was a corrupting influence. The audience argued back, giving Kibo commands on pithy arguments to retort, but the students begged the audience to condemn the killing games. The students tried to change the world with an appeal to empathy. And, like, Kibo is so toxic now. Yeah. Because Kibo's just basically like, lol. Yes. <laughs> like, imagine the internet. You're having an argument with the internet. I know. It's <laughs> terrible. Uh, didn't he also say stuff like, like, this was my favorite character, or, you know, Danganronpa forever, you know, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> Monokuma began the vote. Samugi abstained with the others, knowing Kibo's vote for hope was secure with the wishes of the audience. She'd be executed, but she never expected to survive this game. 
Samugi, the character, would share her fate with her classmates, but Junko would always live to be in the next game. Furthermore, she declared that Kibo would have to be the ultimate survivor in Danganronpa 54. By the rules, Kibo needn't be punished, but Samugi reinterpreted the rules as per Kibo's previous volunteer to be the sacrifice, as well as Team Danganronpa's insistence there be an ultimate survivor in every game. So, huh, it's almost like you're picking and choosing which rules to apply. <laughs> yep. However, Samugi spoke prematurely. The audience had been persuaded by the students' appeals, and the majority of them voted to tell Kibo to abstain. So Kibo abstained, resulting in a null trial, where not a single student voted for hope nor despair. Samugi and Monokuma were shocked, but they realized there was nothing more they could do. The audience had been moved, and the killing games would end. Samugi, however, refused to end the game without a proper execution. She demanded an execution for them all for refusing to vote. Most of the audience began logging off Danganronpa, but the few that remained voted for Kiba to comply with Samugi's last request. She lamented that she had only been a recreated copy of her favorite character, Junko. So a lot happens right there. Yep. Honestly, it's quite surprising considering all the complaints we've had with Danganronpa V3 being the worst game in the series, yet it somehow ends within a very optimistic appeal towards humanity. The, yeah, the, really. The, they convinced the audience to give up Danganronpa, and that's a big thing. Yeah, uh, they convinced the audience that, hey, this series, this piece of media you love, has a death toll attached to it. Please give it up. It's the right thing to do. And you're speaking to the internet here. That's super toxic, right? Mm -hmm. And the internet goes, okay, this one is important. We get it. And they do it. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Maybe it's unrealistic, but I really do believe humans are good. Yeah. I think most of the problems with humanity are corrupting influences, you know, nation states and kind of that kind of stuff that we, you know, we, we have to, there's a reason we have to brainwash people into being bad. Because I think, for the most part, humanity is inherently worth saving. Mm hmm And it really feels like that's what they're saying with this, that ultimately humanity will make the right decision. Because the audience made the right decision in the end. And a lot of people hated this ending because they felt like the whole fictional thing was saying that none of it mattered. But They went to great lengths to say, no, no, it's fiction, but it, it still matters. Yeah, exactly. Because Suichi himself says that fiction has the power to affect the real world. Yeah, people... People act like it was like a twist, like, oh, it was all a dream at the end. But seriously, imagine you watched a movie that had a twist that was all a dream at the end, but the dream inspires the main character to go recreate the events of that dream. Mm -hmm. You might feel like, oh, that might have been a crappy twist, but the whole point is that, no, actually, yeah, it was a dream, but the dream matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And... I just, I feel like that's what it's doing here. The, the whole point of Danganronpa V3 is talking about how fiction affects us. Yeah, and I mean, I agree with the characters in the game, what they say. Fiction has the power to change the world. As much horrible crap I've given Kadaka, you know, he is Smoogie, right? As much as, as sexist and racist as stuff that's happened in this game has been, it's a pretty good finale, yeah. <laughs> I have to admit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting that he actually makes a great point with this story. I wonder if he had help on this part. He probably did. I don't know. But it's interesting that the point that he got really well was about something more eternal and deep within humanity, completely divorced from any particular subset like sex or race. Mm -hmm. But let's finish it out. We got a little bit more. Kibo equipped his weaponry and surreptitiously removed his antenna. His true personality seemed to still reside within him and resurface upon removing the antenna, but he continued with the execution. Fiction. Ultimate annihilation. 
Kibo flew around the academy, destroying it with full force, blasting it from all sides. Samugi, as Junko, along with Monokuma, waved goodbye as a boulder crushed them and killed them. Boulders similarly fell onto Shuichi, Maki, and Himiko, crushing them. After slicing the Sky Dome, Kimo set his self-destruct and rammed into it, punching a hole in the Sky Dome. Meta. However, Kibo had knowingly spared Suichi, Maki, and Himiko with precise blasts, and they only pretended to have died. After clawing out from under the boulders, they looked upon the hole that Kibo had sacrificed himself to make, the hole in the set that led to the real world. They rationalized on whether Samugi had been lying or not, but ultimately, they stepped out of the set to find out for themselves. Yep. So, turns out Kibo didn't die, but then, oh, okay, now he's dead. He's definitely dead now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's, so it's a little ambiguous as to whether it was Kibo or the audience. The way, I, the way I see it is the audience was like, nah, go ahead, kill them all. Get rid of the suffering, and we'll just stop doing this game from now on. And Kibo's like, okay, but we can spare my friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but they made it appear in the fiction that they had all died, even though in the meta narrative they survived. Mm-hmm. Now, the whole thing of like, oh, was Sumugi lying or not? What is this? To me, it just seems like a bunch of wiffly waffly crap to set up another sequel. Maybe, yeah. and, Or an eventual follow-up to the game. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, because obviously, Sumugi had been lying a lot until the end where she started telling the truth. That's kind of how the whole mastermind shtick goes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, fair enough. Um, so that's Danganronpa. And we already talked a lot about the themes so we wanted to spend some time talking about the Danganronpa series as a whole, since this is our last episode. Mm-hmm. You want to go first, Kira? Uh, yeah. All right. What do you think of Danganronpa as a series, and how this has affected you? <sighs> it's a really, really good series, and it's affected me a, lo- a lot. I I love it, and it's it's. Part of been it's been part of us bonding together. Honestly, I told you about the anime, and you watched it, and then you know we ended up watching the whole series of the games played, and we watched Nico B's Bee's playthrough, which is how we discovered Nico B. So like it's also how we discovered Dung and Rapa, and like oh, so this is a game apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we saw the first anime, and that was how we discovered yeah, it. Yeah, we found out that was based on the game. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember who told me about the anime, honestly. I but, don't remember. Okay, but anyway, um, yeah, I think Danganronpa just, it does so well with characterization. And I think this is true of a lot of anime, but I think particularly this one. And the way they have the killing games makes you see the extremes of those characters. You don't even have to see them for very long, and you feel like you've known them their whole lives. Ugh, yes. I've really bonded with these characters. And yes, there's a lot of, like, sexist and racist and homophobic implications throughout the series. Anime is really rife with these things. I don't think they're especially in this anime compared to other anime, but, you know, let's call it for what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a reason that despite that, the Danganronpa series actually has a huge amount of support amongst the, the really progressive people online. Mm-hmm. Like, I've seen a lot of people that like Homestuck also liking Danganronpa. Like, yeah. Like, like us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, and I think part of it is just because the characters are so well-written, they seem real in a way. Yeah. Obviously, this isn't universal. Some characters do this better than others. Even characters I love, like Chiaki, were obviously written to be super likable. Yeah. But then there's characters like Mew, where it's like, you deliberately tried to make her unlikable, and she still works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. It's, I, it's, it's beautiful, and I do kind of like the whole hope versus despair thing. And then I love that the last game just kind of rejects that dichotomy. Mm-hmm. I really like that, too, yeah. And some people hated the ending, but, I mean, we just kind of liked it. I really liked the whole idea of believing in the power of fiction to change the world. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the whole point of being an artist? Why make your art unless you're hoping it will affect someone? Yeah, and that effect... Can be positive or negative, Mm -hmm. but don't we all want it to be positive? Mm Mm-hmm. And it changes you, it changes things, all art does. Yeah. It's important. 
Now, I do think it is important to talk about the future of Danganronpa. Oh, yes. Where is Danganronpa going from here? Now, I want to say that while we have given Kadaka a lot of praise on the finale of V3, one man does not a company make. Mm-hmm. Even though it is clear, as, as we've discussed in our past few episodes, that he gained more and more authorial control over the series as it aged, particularly culminating in this game, mm-hmm. with one of the most sexist openers imaginable, mm-hmm. and also a lot of racism and homophobia. Sumugi was homophobic. Uh, Angie's character was racist. And of course, the sexism in Kaede and Mew. And mm-hmm. Tenko. Tenko was an anti-feminist stereotype. Mm-hmm. So Kadaka has a lot of horrible baggage that for some reason he's feeling more and more willing to disclose. Uh, back in the time of the first Danganronpa games, these issues were much more minor and ignorable. Mm-hmm. They were not nearly as present. Yeah. So where is Danganronpa going from here? Well, the company that made Danganronpa is called Spike Chunsoft. They're the ones that really deserve the credit with the games. Yep. Kadok is just the superstar, the, the infallible god of games. See our episode on that. Mm-hmm. And after this game came out, Kadaka left Spike Chunsoft. He left the company. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what the reasons were, but you can guess. Mm-hmm. He's now forming his own company. I think he's working with one of the creators of Zero Escape or something. Whatever. I don't know. But uh, he's formed his own company, making a new game. He's still working on it now. And it's basically Danganronpa if his genius wasn't hindered. <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of another example in media where that's happened? I wouldn't know. I- I'm sure it's happened somewhere. Yeah. Part of me thinks of like Death Stranding. Does that apply to Death Stranding? I- I seriously don't know. Where people are like, oh, my creative genius is unhindered, and they spend time making this game, and the game is either bad or just kind of weird. Yep. Because <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't say Death Stranding is necessarily bad, but I wouldn't say it's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just mostly weird. Yeah. There's also a lot of problems with it, but you know, we're not talking about that game today. Uh-huh. So Kadaka is making another killing game, another uh, kind of... A uh, bunch, of, bunch of kids get together and they kill each other type of game. Much mm. like Danganronpa. But he was like, no. The problem with Danganronpa was them being barely legal age. At which I would say, yes, that is a problem. We should have adult characters, but why do they have to be barely legal? Why not make them more college age as opposed to like high school or borderline high school college, right? Mm-hmm. Like That's a big thing with anime. It's an annoying trope, particularly when you have overtly sexual characters. And it's just like, just make them adults so you don't have to feel weird about this. Yep. Kadaka yeah, goes, no, I meant the other way. They should all be elementary school age. Yep. Remember Ultra Despair Girls? Where there were hints of pedophilia. Oh, yeah. There were a few scenes that were very yikes. Mm-hmm. Kadaka, I think, was playing his hand a bit too much there. And he might be leaning into that. Yep. I think it'll mostly focus on child murder as opposed to pedophilia. But you know it's going to come up. Yep. You know this guy is not equipped to write stories about children. Yep. So... A lot of people, when they talk about the future of Danganronpa, they talk about that. They talk about him. They talk about where he's going. They talk about the next Danganronpa. Like, the Danganronpa series is over, and the, the big bad creator is going on to make some awesome new thing. And it will be like Danganronpa, but even cooler, because it's the new thing. And he's uninhibited by his genius. I'm telling you, it's going to be bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're going to look at it and see this is why he was inhibited. This is his Star Wars prequels. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, Spike Chunsoft still owns the Danganronpa IP. When Kadaka left, he didn't take that with him. Uh-huh. Spike Chunsoft could make another Danganronpa game. It's honestly amazing they haven't made another Danganronpa game in the time it took us to do this series. It took us forever. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's inevitable, as long as society doesn't collapse if society is still around i think it's inevitable that spike chunsoft will make another danganronpa game it's too lucrative of an ip for them not to i wouldn't be surprised if they're already working on it 
I mean, that's possible, but companies sit on IP all the time. True, but usually because they want to do something about it eventually. Fair enough. At least when it comes to video games, I feel. Yeah. Now, there are some companies that are completely delusional about it. Like Bethesda, for example, sits on IP and doesn't do anything worth doing with it. Mm -hmm. So, like, Bethesda has already missed several opportunities with the Fallout IP, for example. Probably Elder Scrolls, right? Mm Mm-hmm. That's just because Bethesda's a bunch of idiots. Yep. Or at least run by them. Yep. That might change now that Bethesda was bought out. Now, Spike Chunsoft, we don't know if they're that foolish. If they're not fools, they will try to capitalize on this. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think they'll do a better job now that Kadaka's gone. Exactly. Everyone's like, oh no, Kadaka's gone, Danganronpa's over. I'm like, no, no, no. V3 was already kind of a finale. If that was going to make it over, it was going to be over. But Kadaka being gone means that if there is another Danganronpa, it's going to probably be far better. Yeah. You'll probably have significantly less sexism and racism. We might have like a Sonic the Hedgehog situation, where the new Sonic games are being made by fans of the Sonic series. Could you imagine fans of Danganronpa making Danganronpa? Yeah, that'd be cool. That could actually probably be really interesting. Mm-hmm. And Spike Junsoft still owns the IP. And you might say, okay, but... Danganronpa V3 was supposed to be, like, 53. Like, the whole thing ends with them, like, rejecting the notion of a killing game, right? Mm Mm-hmm. How would they ever follow up to that? I argue, easy. You make Danganronpa 4. Mm Mm-hmm. And you can keep going. Do you ever think you're going to get around to 53? Yeah. (laughs) And and basically, you know, you have the concept of a prequel and a sequel, right? Yeah. V3 would be, like, an end cool. (laughs) That would be really cool, actually. Where, you know, you still have years where Spike Chunsoft's like, oh, Spike Chunsoft makes Don and Rampa 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then you, they can have a subtitle for whatever. Call it whatever you want. But they keep making these sequel Don and Rampa games, but they are all prequels to V3, which is the series finale that's already been made. Yep. That'd be cool. And it'd be the kind of sequel or prequel situation where you're like, well, we already know how this ends. Yeah, a hundred years in the future. Don't you want to know what happened a hundred years prior to that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. So, I don't know. I just, I think that's the way for Spike Chunsoft to do it. And Spike Chunsoft, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it's ever going to happen. We're going to die. I'm sorry. But yeah, I hope that they bring it back someday. And even if they don't, it's still a beautiful series. Yeah, it really is. It's got some black marks, some some scratches on it, but definitely worth a perusal. Mm-hmm. Definitely has something to say, and many memorable characters. Yeah. I think the ca- characters will, you know, quite ironically for a game about killing kids, or sorry, uh, young adults... Uh, the young adults are kind of going to outlive the series itself. Mm-hmm. I think people emphasize with the characters much more than they actually did with the events of the game. Yep. Uh, you you see like avatars of people using the characters as their avatars on like Twitter and stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. I just it's nice, and I like the pro humanity message at the end. Yeah, I like it too. It might be a little foolishly optimistic. <laughs> it might be a little underestimating how strong a force brainwashing is in our societies. Yep. But it's great. It is. All right. We're going to have to find a new revisit to do. It yep. will not be hard. <laughs> yep. All right. We have a Twitter, Game Theorems. Check us out. Bye. Bye. <laughs>